so many interesting people. Um, just had the chance to meet a few of you, and it's really amazing how many people we have in this room and how many different perspectives. And we thought that for a first kickoff of our um, mindful leadership talks, uh, we wanted to talk about mindfulness in startups. And I'm going to answer three questions, or I'm trying to answer three questions. The first is, why is mindfulness such a big topic in startups and digital companies? The second question is, what actually do startups, how do they live mindfulness, how do they integrate it in their company culture? And the third one is the most important, what can we learn from that? And that will be my presentation, we will have a discussion afterwards. So if you have really urgent questions, if there is something not clear, you can just raise your arm. But uh, we will have a longer discussion afterwards, so you can also save your questions for later. Okay, cool. So, I think most of you have a definition of what a startup is, but I would like to have a common sense and to talk about um, what this means for the employees of a startup. So, the first thing is that startups, most startups have in common that they are searching for a scalable business model. Yeah? So, they are searching for a model, most of them haven't found it yet, and it should be a scalable business model. So, a model that you can roll out through different markets where you can make a lot of money with. And this is really a lot of pressure you put on yourself when you found a startup. Especially because, and this is my second point, most startups are venture financed and they have an exit strategy. So, they want to either sell the company or they want to go to the stock exchange and they want to have an IPO. So there are a lot of stakeholders, the investors and uh, the board, and they are all putting extra pressure on the employees of that startup. So you have pressure from yourself and you have pressure from outside. And in a lot of companies you have mantras, like for example at Facebook they say, move fast and break things. Have you ever heard that mantra? It was uh, at the entrance of Facebook office, very, very big one, but then a few years ago they put it down because of uh, all the privacy discussions they had. <laughs> so, so this implies two things. The one thing is, it's all about speed. Yeah, you have to be really fast. And the second thing is, it can happen that you break things. Uh, it's already planned that you break things. And by saying things, what are things? Can be projects, can be clients, but can be also be human beings, yeah, can be employees. So there is a lot of pressure on these people, they work in a very fast-paced environment and not everyone is made for that. Yeah. So when you look at startups you only see all these smiling winners, the one of ten companies, but you don't see all the people in all the companies that don't make it and there are a lot. And the pressure is also pretty high because you work in small teams and you have a lot of responsibility. So I worked in a startup for five years and I had this fancy title VP Marketing, Vice President. Um, and actually I did everything what you can put in a marketing bucket. You know? So press releases, event organization, website, internationalization and so on. So it's a lot of pressure on one person to do that. Um, I had, at the end I had one, two people in my team. but. At the beginning I was doing it completely on my own. And that is what a lot of people in startups do. They, they are like entrepreneur or what you sometimes say intrapreneur. Yeah, people who are, who are owners of a topic and who work really hard to fulfill the goals and yeah, to, to do a good job. And I'm sure you all heard about agile product development. So agile means that you're not plan to develop a product like in a year or two years. And then after two years you see, hmm, maybe it works on the market, maybe not. What you do is that you develop in very small steps and you always evaluate the result. Yeah? So you always look, what's the minimum effort to have the maximum outcome? That is called the minimum viable product. And this is really a great thing because you don't waste so much time and you don't build products that nobody likes. But on the other hand, this means for people, for employees and companies, they can't plan, they don't know what happens next year, sometimes they even don't know what happens next month. 
Yeah, so there's a lot of uncertainty also. And there's a really uh, nice word in the startup industry. It's called pivot. Who knows what pivot means in the startup environment? A lot of people? <laughs> just <laughs> just words. Yeah. You want to say it or uh, pivot? Yeah, the pivot is when you have an idea and then you realize that oh my god, it kind of doesn't work very well for the market. We have to change something, so then you change and you need to pivot in and do all kind of left, yeah. right, ten step back forward <laughs> to just adjust it to the market. And then they go in That's the correct. Origin comes from tango. Hmm. Huh? <laughs> tango? <laughs> So the ah, it's a tango move. You do a pivot. Yeah, that works. So pivot means not only adjusting the strategy a little bit, it means you're doing a 180 degrees turn and you do something totally different. And this is something that not only happens sometimes, uh, in some companies it happens a few times per year. So that's the agility we are talking about. The ones who don't hear. <laughs> the ones who don't yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm telling you all of this not to glorify the work in startups, obviously. Um, I have a lot of enthusiasm about startups. I think there are a lot of new ways to work and new ways to build products that are really amazing. So I'm very enthusiastic about it. But on the other hand, it's really a lot of pressure, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, complexity and acceleration for people working in those companies. When I moved to Berlin eight years ago, um, I found myself in a really exciting environment. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of opportunities. Yeah, opportunities for going to party, opportunities for culture, um, but also opportunities for founding a business, for going to business events like today, for meeting exciting people. And I um, selected this picture because this was it's a very good picture for my feeling. Uh, there was a lot going on good things, bad things, but I was in a flash. And then one day I came home from work and I came into my um, sleeping room and it was like someone hit me with a hammer. Uh, so I lost my balance, fall down, and I was deaf on the one side of my head for let's say a minute, I don't really know how, much, how long it was. And after recovering there was this tinnitus. Mm -hmm. I think you, you all know it, a lot of people have a tinnitus. And in this moment, which was a very dark moment for me, but on the other hand, something became clear to myself. That was a warning shot. Yeah? That's the moment when your body shows you, you're not living very healthy. You can't continue to live like that. And I had to make a decision. So option A was, I moved back to my smaller village, working in a smaller company, having a more planable life, or I still work in a startup, maybe I even found a startup. I'm enthusiastic about working and I stay in Berlin, but then I have to find a way to do it aligned with my body, not against myself. And for me that was the start of a very exciting journey and I call it searching for here and now. Because I realized that I was never in the really, really in this moment. I was never really present. I was always thinking about what's the next meeting, what can I prepare for that, what's next week happening, how can we have the best figures or best numbers for the next year and so on. So I think, and maybe you agree with this, we are all trained to either think about the future and predict or to learn from the past and to look back. And I did a lot of different stuff, so this is why I chose the maze here. Yeah? So I went to doctors, I went to uh, Qigong, something that I'm doing now for seven years. Um, I did yoga, meditation, MBSR, mindfulness. And I started to find my own practice and my own ways to, to deal with the pressure, to deal with complexity, with acceleration, um, digitalization and all these things. And the bottom line from this journey for me is mindfulness. So mindfulness is the capability to be present in the here and now 
and to have a high awareness for your thoughts, for your emotions, for your body, but also for the person in front of you and for the people around you, what we did in the meditation at the beginning. And you do all this in a mind state of being present, humble, curious, but also compassionate. Yeah? It's a lot about being kind to yourself, being kind to other people. So that is what mindfulness means to myself. And the title of this presentation is Mindfulness in Startups. And when we talk about startups, of course, we always take a look at the Silicon Valley because most of the trends we see today come from the Silicon Valley. And these are just a few headlines I found uh, on my research. So one is from San Francisco Chronicle. Meditation helps speed-driven Silicon Valley types to slow down and accomplish more. And I think that this shows very impressive that mindfulness is a big topic at the Silicon Valley. And when you look at the big companies, they are not startups anymore, um, but they are definitely companies who work with startup methods and who claim to be startups. And when you look at the CEOs and at the founders, you will see at Apple, at Facebook, Twitter, Salesforce, they all are meditators and they communicate that they are meditators. So it's nothing they do just on their private side of life and they, they don't want people to see that. They openly communicate it and they also want to bring it into the culture of their companies. And I think that's the strongest mm -hmm. argument that you can have when the CEO of a company is an evangelist for mindfulness. And I think the most well-known um, startup founder or tech company um, CEO is Steve Jobs. And I would like to read this quote for you because I find it very nice. Steve says, if you just sit and observe, you will see how restless your mind is. If you try to calm it, it only makes it worse. But over time, it does calm. And when it does, there is room to hear more subtle things. And that is when your intuition starts to blossom and you start to see things more clearly and be in the present more. Your mind just slows down and you see a tremendous expanse in the moment. You see so much more than you could see before. That's fascinating. And it's not just one guy working in a startup. It's uh, pretty much the face of the Silicon Valley for a couple of years. So let's look in other companies. At Google, mindfulness is also a big topic. Um, there was this guy that you can see on this picture, it's Chait Meng Teng, um, a product developer at Google, and he used the 20% of the time that you can use at Google for own projects to build an own mindfulness program. And he invited um, big names like John Kabat-Zinn, um, the founder um, of MESR, and Daniel Goleman, who is very uh, famous for his emotional intelligence um, science research. And they invented together this search inside yourself method that they applied for Google. And then it was so successful that they founded an own institute. And now they're rolling it out all over the world. And we even have some people here in the room who did the training. Can you raise your hands? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. So one company that is very um, transparent and open about working with this program is SAP. So a big German company with over 90,000 people all over the world. And they say that they already trained 6,500 people and they already have a waiting list with more than 7,000 people. And they did a lot of research. And one of the most impressive numbers is that they have a return on invest of 200%. So you invest money in a mindfulness program and actually also on a um, measurable business level you see that there is an increase. How do you measure that? Hmm? How do you measure? Venture? No, how do you measure uh, ah, the return um, on investment? I don't know how they measure the return on invest. Um, I, don't, I don't think that they published the details. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the simplest way is to um, calculate what you invest in terms of how much money does it cost to fly in all the employees, yeah. yeah? 
um, to have this training, uh -huh. this two-day training, and then to uh, research how um, the days are reduced, they um, call in sick. Uh -huh. So the and yeah. absentism and there the we see <clears throat> that they just get more resilient. And then there are things like um, more engaged, more trustful, um, and they also, well, there is a way how to evaluate this or to count you, this. Is it like possible to measure that reliably 10% more sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah, the numbers that we see here are from employee surveys. So they do a lot of employee surveys where they ask questions and they do it before and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they can measure with these KPIs that there is an impact, and they also measure that there is an impact on the um, colleagues of people who did the program, yeah? not only the people who participated actively. But of course, you can question the methodology, or but it, it is something that we can work with. Yeah? It's not just I, I feel better. Yeah, you really have some outcome that's measurable. But we can have that in the discussion afterwards. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's a good topic. Um, another company that's really into mindfulness is Salesforce and they have in every office um, around the world they have a mindfulness room that you can use for meditation or for just relaxing. And when they opened one office they invited Thich Nhat Hanh, which is a very um, famous uh, Buddhist monk and he came with the other Buddhist monks in a plane, they checked the office and they consulted the company pretty much. On what they think about it and how you can combine mindfulness with um, working. And that's got a really interesting thing. So another example, Twitter. Um, the founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, uh, in December he published a tweet, obviously, and he said, for my birthday this year I did a 10-day silent Vipassana meditation. I don't know if you're familiar with Vipassana, it's a very um, very advanced form of meditation. So in a retreat you have 10 days um, where you do meditation from the morning to the evening. In this program it was 17 hours per day, just sitting on the ground even if, if, you, um, if it aches. And he shot a lot of more tweets around this topic to explain why he thinks that this is so powerful and that helps him to, um, to achieve more. And just one quote from this, he said, you can hack the deepest layer of the mind and reprogram it. Yeah, and I really like this quote because it shows here's a tech guy, yeah, here's a startup founder, and this is the way a lot of people approach mindfulness. They really think about it like a software and you can hack it and then it can become better. Yeah. Without glorifying it, without judging it, it's just a very interesting observation. So, and it's obvious that when you have so many um, meditation enthusiastic people in the Silicon Valley, that there are also a lot of apps around this. Yeah? So, most of you might have heard about Headspace. Um, they did a lot of advertising in Berlin in the last weeks. Um, and Headspace is founded by a Buddhist monk, actually. Um, and it's, I think it's uh, yeah, one of the most popular apps. Um, there's also a very good app from Berlin. It's Seven Mind. Um, they have a German version, but also in English, so you can check that out if you're interested. And there are even there's a new generation of mindfulness apps. It's mindfulness apps that come with technology, with gadgets. So what Muse does is it measures your brain wave and gives you uh, feedback how good your meditation was, how deep your practice was. Yeah. And I know a few people using it, I never used it, and I still find it strange. Um, but I think it really helps when you just want to measure the, the work of your brain, uh, when you want to understand how your brain works and how to control it and stuff like that. But of course, it doesn't matter measure the whole human being. So there was a monk um, who was measured uh, for a few days after meditation because they did some exercise. Uh, some um, studies, and he asked them, why are you measuring here, why are you not measuring here? <laughs> so that's the difference between the Western world and the Eastern world, mm -hmm. pretty much a modern <laughs> example. Yeah, and there are also a lot of companies and a lot of places in Berlin where you find meditation and mindfulness. 
Um, just one example, because we are actually in this beautiful place right now. There is a meditation room just upstairs, and uh, there is an offering for meditation, and for yoga, like this morning, and other things. And one um, example that I really like, um, at the co-creation loft you have three at three. This means that at 3 p.m. every day there are three minutes of silence. So this is a very easy thing, easy to integrate. People can use the silence just for closing their eyes and relaxing. They can also use it to meditate. And actually it's different to, sell, to tell the, the difference between it. Um, and uh, this is something you find at a lot of companies. So for example, Zalando has meditation rooms too. And we see that this is really happening uh, in the last years and there's more and more. So these were a lot of examples. And for me, my bottom line for this is that mindfulness is a big topic. It is increasing, especially at startups, but also in traditional companies. And I see three drivers for that, three reasons why people in startups do it. The first reason is, and you remember my first slide, um, there are a lot of new challenges and you have to face these challenges. You have to live in a more accelerated world, in a more complex world with a lot of pressure, a lot of uncertainty. So you have to find new ways to deal with it. And for some people, mindfulness, meditation is a way um, yeah, to deal with this. Um, another reason is, for some people, to be one second ahead. So one second doesn't sound so much, but you have, if you have to make a decision and you have one second to go out of the autopilot into the driver's seat and you can make a real smart decision, it can save you hours, it can save you millions. And I think that this is something that a lot of people yeah, could need because a lot of people think working more brings you one second ahead. But sometimes it's stepping back that brings you one second. And the third reason that I found, also in interviewing a lot of people from startups, is that a lot of companies want to do things different. Uh, they want to have a very diverse um, staff uh, company. They want to work on a flat hierarchy level. Um, there are a lot of trends that, that all of you might know. And I think that mindfulness is also something you can implement to be different and to try new ways. And I think that is actually the most important thing for, for all of us and the motivation for myself also to do more into mindfulness. I want to create a new work environment. A work environment that is made for human beings and that puts the human beings in the center and not just the product or the money. And I think we are creating new work environments right now in a lot of companies. but. I think that in most companies, mindfulness and compassion are missing. So we can't just adopt flat hierarchies, um, we can't just take objectives and key results, or scrum and agile methods. We also have to adapt and we also have, can try new ways to have this all with a mindful and compassionate um, yeah, mindset. And this is the one thing I would like to give you for, for today, so when you leave today, I hope that you agree with me or that you um, yeah, had a few thoughts about this. How does the working space we want to work in look like? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad that I met uh, Jana and Nico um, like one year ago, and Nico already mentioned that in the last half year <laughs> we, we did a lot of work together. We developed a program that is called The Mindful Company. And the idea is to combine a lot of different um, methods and programs, like Search Inside Yourself, MBSR and others, and to bring them in a new way that works for startups, for digital companies. Um, and also, what's very important for us is that it has a transformation. So it's not just inspiring or a little training that you like, but then two weeks later you forgot about it. It's about really changing the culture of the company. And that is why our program is six weeks and not just two hours. Mm -hmm. And one of our um, projects that we are working on right now is with SoundCloud. Yeah, so SoundCloud is one of the big tech companies coming from Berlin. And with SoundCloud we're doing our six-week program 
for the first time in a completely digital version. The reason for this is that SoundCloud has a lot of offices around the world, especially in New York and Berlin, and we want to do, have the same experience for everyone and to use mindfulness also mm. to bring people together and to integrate. And we are excited to, to look at the results of our studies that we are also doing. So, we really believe that mindful leadership um, is very important for the society today. I said we're living in a times of acceleration, of complexity, of digitization, globalization. And in this new time, we need new methods for leadership. And when I say leadership, I mean self-leadership company leadership, but also on a society level. And that is the reason why we founded the Mindful Leadership Circle, beginning of this year, which is a professional network of, on the one hand, mindfulness experts, like coaches, speakers, authors. On the other hand, professionals who work who are leaders, who um, are founders, and who want to integrate mindfulness into the company culture and want to change exchange best practices and want to learn from others. So this network is planned as a platform where people meet, where they can exchange, where they can co-create and where we can be one platform that talks to the politicians, to the media and to give this a little bit more drive. If that sounds interesting to you, just talk to me, to Jana or to Nico and that's pretty much the end of my talk and I'm very happy and thank you all.